here's this stuff down in B prime. Some of it has to do with correctness, but some of it apparently has to do with pleasantness and hospitality. So let's ask people from Michigan where the most pleasant English is spoken. And look, stuff has come down a notch or two, right? Michiganders are no longer eight, now they're seven. They're no longer alone. They believe that people from Illinois and Minnesota and Colorado and Washington are just as pleasant as they are. And Alabama is no longer a three, now it's a four. So Michiganders don't seem to have as much stuff invested. If I was a Marxist, I would say that their linguistic capital is less focused on correctness is more focused on correctness and less focused on pleasantness. This makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, there, there's just less differentiation here. So what does this mean? This trip, right, this is not such a bad trip anymore. You only go from a seven to a four. Remember, for correctness, you went from eight all the way down to three. So what kind of place is the United States? There are several possibilities. Let's say that people from Michigan are LV1 speakers. By language variety one, I mean something closer to the standard, something proved up by schools and the ultimate smart LX English teachers and people like that. As opposed to LV2 speakers, we'll say that these are speakers from the South or these are speakers of non-admired or non-prestige dialects. Well, if we look at correctness and pleasantness, that means that we could say, and many, many uh, sociologists of language have told us this, that language has both a status dimension and a solidarity dimension. On the one hand, I'm proud of my language because I talk good. On the other hand, I'm proud of my language because, you know, it's, it's what gets me in with you. You know, we talk this way, and so I can talk to you. You understand me. When I talk, you feel warm and fuzzy and like you're at home, right? Probably none of you do the way I'm talking there. But if I was in Louisville, people would feel real good about it. They would feel like cuddling with me. <laughs> so, what are the possible reactions to this stuff? Is it just majority group? That is, do LV1, majority speakers, and LV2 speakers, minority speakers, on both the dimensions of status and solidarity, always like LV1? This may seem impossible to you, but this was a status in French-speaking Canada years and years ago. Canadian French speakers were so downtrodden by the English majority that they not only preferred English for the status variety in Canada, they even preferred it for solidarity. They thought that people who didn't speak their own variety were friendlier. This is no longer true, thank goodness, in Canada, because they managed to, uh, to, how shall I say, upgrade their opinion of themselves. But something else might happen. This seems reasonable, right? So the, uh, the majority group, these Michigan-type guys, they, they like themselves for friendliness, and they know they talk good. And the poor old downtrodden LV2 speakers, well, they know it's the LV1 speakers who got the status, but... <laughs> You know, the way we talk, that's, let, let's get together and talk, you know, the way we talk and not pay no attention to no rules and no northerners or no, no silly stuff. Or, could be this, could be just <coughs> simply divided, right? So that the LV1 speakers like themselves for both status and solidarity, and then the minority group speakers, they also like their own speech for status and solidarity. This is the case in modern Norway, for example. In fact, it's hard to divide uh, uh, Nynorsk and Bokmal, the two standard varieties of Norwegian from one another, because the guys who speak Nynorsk, yes, it's good state of stuff, and we like each other. The guys who speak Bokmal, yes, it's good state of stuff, and we like each other. This is hard for Americans to understand, but it exists in some places. Or it could be really weird, right? It could be that everybody likes the standard variety for status, but, and this is a weird one, right? That first green one is where even the majority speakers find the minority variety to be more friendly. Some of you may already be getting a little nervousness in the, where you're sitting, thinking about this as a possibility. How can we find this out? Well, first we ask Alabama speakers where the most correct English was spoken. Now, this is, this is, this is just unbelievable for people from Michigan. When people from Michigan <laughs> see that the same sort of ne'er-do-well five was given to both Alabama and Michigan, I've had, I've had Michigan people to faint when they saw this map, and I had to give them smelling salts and stuff. Because, well, in Michigan we talk good. Well, these guys in Alabama crazy. Don't they know how bad they are? But these guys in Alabama are just not <laughs> invested in correctness at all. they got a little correctness pocket over here in Washington, D.C. and Maryland, but it's not a big deal. It's only a seven, right? Now can I show you where Alabama speakers think of pleasantness? Bang! <laughs> Alabama and Alabama only. 
and uh, this trip is now not a very happy one, right? It goes all the way from an eight down to a four, but I just want you to notice over here that New Jersey has a two. <laughs> so if you live in Alabama and you hear somebody from New Jersey speak, that's fingernails on the blackboard. I mean, that's just got to be the ugliest, nastiest, unpleasant stuff you've ever heard in the world. So now we see that the Michigan and Alabama guys are doing something backwards. But we still don't know which one of those possibilities we'd like to say for all of America. It looks like this, yeah? Looks like the Michigan guys like themselves for status. They're okay with solidarity. It's not a big deal for them. And it kind of looks like LV1 is preferred by the Alabama guys, but they sure love the way they talk, right? So let's try to tease this out of the Michigan guys. Here's what we did. We gave a map of dialect areas, folk dialect areas, to Michiganders and asked them to just say all the words that came into their head about the way people talk that way. And they gave us words like this, bad English, good English, smart, dumb, speak with a drawl, speak without a drawl, formal, casual, nasal, not nasal. Nasality, drawling, and twanging are the big three in American folk linguistics. Drawl, twang, and nasal. We know what nasal, we know what nasal is, we don't have no problem with nasal. Although many people call denasalized speech also nasal. Right now, for example, I'm allowing no noise to come out of my nose. And some people call this nasal. It can't be nasal because I am allowing no air whatsoever to go into my nasal passages. But people talk that way when they get a cold, of course. When you got, well, I don't want to mention anything unpleasant, but when your nose is full of stuff, then you can't have a nasal voice, and yet many people call it nasal. That's another point, another lecture. So, we gave those things on a six-point scale to Michigan respondents. And we said, okay, the north, where you live, and the south, like Alabama, where you don't live. And you can see that Michiganders, they have no, this is a six-point scale, 5.11 is the mean. They have no drawl. They have no twang. They're normal. You already saw that on the map. They're smart. They speak good English. And then the scores start to get worse. Yeah? On a six-point scale, they're not so good. 